Hello, everyone. Um, we are live. It is Counselor at Large, Julia Mejia. You're tuning in uh, to Woke Women Wednesdays when we talk about all things black and brown, the breakdown. Um, today is Wednesday, June the 23rd. And as everything goes, uh, you know that on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock in the morning, you kick things off with my sister in service, Senator Diane Wilkinson. And then you um, uh, link up with me at eight uh, and we break it down. So I'm really excited uh, tonight um, because we have someone who I actually met along the way um, and who I actually spent some time with her dad um, many, 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 many years ago, even before I was a candidate um, and doing a lot of work in, in the building of the relationships between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And I got to meet her dad then. And uh, I saw her um, along the way. And she is here today to, um, I'm just gonna bring her on. She is running for at-large city councilor. And I'm so excited to have someone who I know is deeply rooted in the community that is going to bring that fire that we need um, to change the way we do business in City Hall. I am pleased to present to you Ruthsi Louis-Jean. Um, who is at live with us? Hey, hi, Julia. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so very much for making the time to be with us tonight. I know you have, I'm sure, a packed schedule because there has not been one event that I've been at that you have not been there. So I know you are ground, you're grinding out in these streets and you're making it happen and you're doing such an amazing job um, connecting with voters um, and doing the work. But before we dive into your race, I really would love an opportunity for our audience to get to know who you are. So if you well, could just- I have to mention though that we met at Miriam's Kwanzaa, uh, Kwanzaa Hanukkah party. And then a few yeah. weeks later, I was at your inauguration party at Hibernian Hall in, in yes. New York. So yeah, I would have never thought then um, that our world will collide as much as they have. But yeah. I will say is that you know I met your dad probably like seven or eight years ago. Um, I was a panelist, mm -hmm. maybe uh, maybe five or six years ago. I don't know when it was, but it was it was during the Haiti um, when there was a lot of tension um, between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And mm -hmm. I, as an Afro Latina, I really recognize the tension. <laughs> you know, I know right? So. Um, but I always lead with understanding history and a true sense of self. And sometimes even as a Dominican, it's really important for me to speak truth, even though it may not be uh, embraced um, in my circle. But I, I stood um, in solidarity alongside my Haitian brothers and sisters uh, many, many, many years ago and continue to do so. So it was through that work that I met your dad. And so I'm so incredibly grateful that you're running and it gives me so much hope as the first Afro-Latina to serve on the council to know that you're running. Um, you'll be the first Haitian American to serve on the council and it is time for the city of Boston to have representation. And so I'm really, incredibly grateful to you for running um, and doing so with so much grace. Um, so can you just, uh, you know, utilize this opportunity. We wanna know who you are, so talk to us. Hi everyone, uh, Julia, thank you for that wonderful introduction. So um, I'm Rootsy, Rootsy louis uh born and raised in Mattapan, uh, Mattapan stand up. Uh, literally grew up um, on, uh, right off of River Street um, right across from where the Planet Fitness is now. That used to be um, a star market that me and my friends on the street would go and buy like Airheads and all these like all these like crazy candies. Um, and so I grew up there. My parents are immigrants from Haiti. Um, very typical immigrant story. Came here with nothing um, but a sense of like the American dream and wanted to make a better life for them and my sisters. Um, when I tell y'all my parents grew up poor, like my dad grew up in abject poverty. Who let you talk about meeting my dad? My dad, his origin stories, you know, he used to plant mango seeds um, with the hope that they would grow to provide some food the next day. Kids would write on his shirt in school to see if he would come to school with the same clothing the next day. And of course he did. So when I say that my parents, my dad especially came from the gutter, like he did, and he really fought 
tooth and nail in this country to, to make it his own in a city like Boston, which often feels very exclusionary to uh, immigrants, to black immigrants, to folks who don't speak this language, right? My parents came here without the ability to speak English and without the ability to navigate a complicated city. Um, and they worked really, really hard. So you see me grinding out there, you see me, you know, going from event to event, connecting with voters. It feels, not only does it fill my entire heart, but that is the grit and the work that I know from the examples that I've been given. My father, my mother, uh, my grandmother who helped raise us, God bless her, just turned 90 yesterday in Haiti. Um, and she helped raise us when we were young. And like, she was the one when my parents were working like overtime and double shifts. She was the one who was the homework enforcer to make sure me and my um, three sisters were doing our homework. And uh, what was, what, 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 what I what is remarkable about that and about the role that she played in our lives growing up when our parents were working is that she was the homework enforcer making sure we did all our work. And I didn't find out until my 20s that my grandmother can't even read or write. So she was there making sure that we were doing what we had to do to excel and push forward. Um, meanwhile, she didn't even have the tools that she wanted us to have. Mm -hmm. And so when I when I talk about where I, who I am and where I come from, it's always important for me to talk about what has come before me, my parents, my grandparents, I come from a lineage of very strong women, strong black women who um, pushed through depression, who pushed through um, discrimination to really claim their space and to make a better world for the ones to come. So that's that's who I am. Um, I am the daughter of a, of a father who is, I, I tell people that I am my father's carbon copy. So if you know my dad, you know me. He is a, someone who is rooted and steeped in community who will give you the shirt off his back who is dependable. My father will never tell you that he's gonna show up and he's not there. So that is my model for how to engage and how to love your neighbor and how to really be steeped in community, people before profit. My father doesn't know what it means. If he, if you need a dollar and he has two or a dollar in his pocket, that's your dollar. You know what I mean? And so that is the model for community engagement. That is the model for community-based leadership that I have, that I wanna bring to Boston City Council to help amplify the voices of community. You're right. like. Boston has the third largest Haitian diaspora, and yet we don't have that political power. Um, and so it's time. It's been time. Um, and as a woman who grew up, my parents were like, you know, insisted on me uh, reading, speaking, and writing Creole so I can speak it, write it. Um, same thing with French. Um, you know, I my Spanish is okay. I can get through a conversation until a translator gets there. So it's really about like, how are we creating a city that looks like one of the ones I grew up in? I grew up on a working class street, poor folk, working class folk. Um, that were of all colors, right? So one of the issues that we talk about um, is about like how we've racialized poverty to make it seem as though the only poor folk in this city and in this country are Black and Latinx folk, but like poverty knows no color. It disproportionately affects Black and Latinx folks because of this country's history of racism and legacies of white supremacy. But we know, I know growing up, my neighbors were poor working class, like my family, white families, Black families, Asian families. And so how do we show up for all of these families? Sorry, that was a little segue for me talking about me to me talking about the issues, but like I am, you know, it, it goes hand in hand. You know what I mean? As a Black woman existing in a city like Boston, your identity is so political and who I am is so political. How I show up in this world is political. So, No, I, I appreciate that. You know, you said something that I've been fighting a lot on the council around is uh, literacy and um, information justice. Yeah. We filed an ordinance recently to do a deep dive and an audit on the literacy rates because I know my mom didn't finish even third grade. Yeah. And so I was able to drop out of school and do a lot of things and get away with a lot of things because my mom did not know how to speak English, nor did she know um, or didn't have a comfortable command of what was written to her. So I would always read it in the way that would have benefit me yes. or, or just do a disservice to me really because I dropped out of school, but anyways, went back. Mm -hmm. But I say this is because when you have that lived experience and you have, and you carry those stories in your heart, the way you lead, and the things that you push for are very different and unique to your own experience. And so that's why I, I really do appreciate you uplifting that and, 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 and naming it, right? And, and that's what these times require, Rootsi, is, is that that level of deep rootedness in what it is that we're all dealing with. And I love the fact that you also talked about um, this whole, I, I oftentimes see as, as the Poverty Olympics, right? Um, we're always trying to see who has the least. When in reality, if we're really serious about that conversation, is that we're we're, we're fighting. We're, we are targeting. Um, we're doing this, 
right? We punched, it's easy to punch down. Exactly. When we should be punching up. Exactly. And we need to all be working together across our differences and our silos and our lived experience and having one target. But yet a lot of the conversations here and having grown up here in the city of Boston during the busing era, having to survive that trauma is still manifest and it still shows up in so many different ways. So I really love the fact that you are really being intentional about the inclusivity of that work. Um, so, so thank you for, for, for that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Yeah. Um, you, I know you went to Boston public schools, right? Yeah. You're a lawyer. Come on, lawyer. Give, it, give it to I, us. Talk I'm to those us. things. All right. So my journey, I went to Boston public schools. I went to Taylor, um, first from, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade. I have so much love for the Taylor school. Um, my dad, you know, I was talking about my dad and how he didn't speak English, but my dad, knew that education was the only way. He was like, this is the only way. So he was the head of the parent teachers council. In his like very heavily accented English, he was up in my school. And I was like, even if I went and wanted to misbehave, I couldn't because my father was like literally in the door looking to make sure that I was doing my homework. You know what I mean? Like that I wasn't acting up. And I did have a lot of behavioral problems when I was in elementary school and middle school. Um, and but it was hard because my dad was always there. So to try to correct that. And so uh, I grew up going to the Taylor. I went to the McCormick uh, for the sixth grade. Uh, I was on a call with a bunch of folks today who were like, wow, you survived the McCormick. And it was it was interesting because I saw it, you know, that's where I really, really leaned into my love for basketball. So I played on the basketball team. I was actually a ball girl that year for the Celtics rookie team. So I was up at UMass, um, you know, give, handing out water to the rookie players on the Celtics and wiping down their sweat. And I was so, I don't think I've ever been more anxious in my life. Cause I was like, I, I didn't want to look them in the eye, but that was just like my love for basketball really developed at the McCormick. Um, and at the McCormick, I got, I, from there, I, you know, got into the exam school and I've been blessed with a number of really great teachers in my, throughout my entire academic life, but I'll never forget, you know, cause I was saying in sixth grade, I had you know, I wasn't the best student. Like I, you know, I was having, I had some, I like talking, you know, obvious, that's obvious. I'm a talker, but you know, when you're young and especially when you're a young black girl in class, that's misinterpreted as you being someone who like is out of order. So I remember, I'll never forget telling my sixth grade social studies teacher that I got into Boston Latin school. She looked at me and she was like, you got into Latin. You'll be back here next year. Meaning that I wouldn't be able to handle it and that I would, wouldn't meet up to the level of difficulty of the school and like I didn't let that phase me like I'm not one of those people like I didn't I didn't hold on to it and it wasn't like a chip I, I like this woman was 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 just like a she was sad and like it was just a her thing but I never forget that because like in life you always have people who will doubt you and who won't think that you can do something and like yeah I got to Latin and it was really hard it was hard for a very long time and I didn't make um A's and B's until my 10th grade like it was a hard I was still dealing with like talking out of turn and I was still dealing with the, you know, there was the, the classwork was rigorous, but I finally hit my groove and then I never turned back. And so from Latin school, I went to Columbia, New York for undergrad, um, which was well, a really What year were you there? I, I graduated Columbia 08. Okay. Cause I, I lived in New York. What years were you there? I was there from 97 to 2009 or 10. Okay. So we probably overlapped. Where yeah. did you Where did you hang out? I lived well. I lived on One Forty Fifth and Riverside, and I hung, okay. Um, and I hung out. Um, there's a little um spot called Sip um Cafe con Leche. I used to wait tables at mm -hmm. Cafe con Leche. It's a little small um Spanish food restaurant in um on the other or west side. But yeah, mm -hmm. those yep. are my old stomping grounds. Yep, yep. So I was I was everywhere. Um, actually, this interview I did with Columbia just came out today. Like. One of the good things about going to a place like New York and being Haitian is that like I have family in every borough. So like mm -hmm. and people. So I was I was in Queens. I was in Jamaica, Queens. I was in Carnarsie and Crown Heights. Like my my Haitians are everywhere. So I was everywhere. Um, go hanging out with cousins and uncles. And then like that's actually where I did a lot of my work with uh, the Haitian Dominican communities trying to forge the love on our island. I actually live, I don't know if you know this, I lived in DR for a little bit. That's where my Spanish comes from. My best friend here is Dominican and Haitian. So I lived with her family in Via Maya, um, in, in uh, La Capital for some time. And so, um, you know, that's where I really fell in love with, with everything that was other, with like appreciating other cultures, really realizing that like, even though without our, 
you know, despite all of our differences, there's so much that roots us in common. So I was like living in Dominic in the Bronx with all the Dominicans for a bit. I studied abroad in, in Senegal. And I think it was like a, just a great opportunity for me to. Wow. Like, you know, it was a really great opportunity in general for me to be just be in a space where like people were from everywhere. And I, I like learn, uh, you know, I very much am someone who learns through people. Like I will, a conversation is like my favorite thing because we all have something to teach each other, you know? Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a lyric in a song somewhere that's like, I've been to school for 21 years and my best teacher is experience, right? I still yeah. believe that. I've been to school a whole bunch. I got, you know, I went to Harvard Law School and I went to the Kennedy School for Public Policy, but my best teacher has been life, right? And so there are things that you can't learn in a classroom and in a book. And so I think my time uh, when I was at Columbia and afterwards really being steeped in these like very rich, very different communities was just like so enriching to my soul. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm obviously someone who's an extrovert. I get my energy from being around other people, uh, from being soaked in sort of their experience. Like, again, I like being an open book. Um, as someone, I grew up in I grew up in a Christian household in a church, but I learned a lot from my Muslim brothers, from my from my Jewish sisters. Like, what can we learn from each other, and how can we like enjoy and like take pride? Like, I am a very proud Haitian person, but I take you know I respect where you come from and love the fact that you love, for example, your Dominicanness, or you love your Jewish identity, right? Or you love showing up in this world as a Muslim person or as a Baha'i, right? Like how do we how do we celebrate each other and make sure that we're including everyone at the table? Those are the things that I just thrive off of and really love and care about. So yeah. my friends look like the United Nations. Like I just um, am someone who just, I'm enriched by conversation and, and, and learning from other people. No, I love that. I remember when I went to college, I went to Mount Ida um, mm-hmm. and I grew up in Dorchester and I, I didn't realize that, and this is my ignorance, but you know, anytime we saw somebody that was white, they were either taking somebody away or DCF was coming to get somebody. Or yeah. Yeah. Being locked up. And so my exposure to white culture didn't yeah. happen until I went to college. And mm-hmm. even though it was Mount Ida and I didn't even know that white people were like, you know, that they were Italians and that they were like Jewish. I'm like, no, no, got diversity even among white people. Like, right. so going to college was the first time that I ever had an opportunity to step outside of my own little block. Yeah. But then when I moved to New York, that's really when um, working in New York and having the opportunity to be there, I got to see a whole different world. And it wasn't mm-hmm. until I came back from living in New York to moving back to Boston, that I realized how segregated Boston was. I didn't, I didn't realize the racism, but it took me having to leave to come back to recognize it because yes. it, it, it was something that I'd never really thought about because it wasn't part of my, I, it was just, it was the way that it was and that's it. But being in other spaces helped me realize how messed up Boston was in many ways. And you know, like I, I always, Think about that moment when I went to college and a lot of my friends would say to me, oh, you think you're white now just because I went to college. I'm like, oh, my God. So first of all, I don't even know where that's coming from. Mm-hmm. But I felt like I had betrayed my hood just because I went on to college and it, it felt so. I felt guilty and it was weird mm-hmm. for me to feel that way because I felt like I'm going to college because I'm, you know, I was inspired to graduate high school and go to college. And so. I, I struggled with that sense of um, of survivor's guilt, if you will, because yeah. most of my friends, you know, we I grew up in during the crack, and you know, in violence era in Boston, and so I, I feel that sense of survivor's guilt. Um, but that exposure and living in New York really put a lot of things in perspective for me. So I'm so glad that you had an opportunity to go to Senegal and, and, and to be in all these spaces because that makes you so much more richer in your thought process and yeah. how you experience things and how you're able to bring people together across all of their differences, right? So I think that that world view has really prepared you for this moment. Yeah. Yeah, and it's prepared me, but you know what, like, I, what I look back on and very grateful is the street I grew up on, right? Because like I was like I was telling you, my I didn't know that it was a, that it was a you know of course later I grew up like we were talking about how Boston is so segregated, our neighbors are neighbors are so segregated. But growing up for me, 
Louis Jens, the Haitian, we were Haitian family. Next to us was a Polish American family, the Trzinskis, right? So it was the Louis Jens and the Trzinskis growing up, poor working class families. And so for me, the way, so I always, I, I guess I grew up with this understanding of like, oh, like white people can be poor and working class as well, right? Like there's nothing, but then to understand when I, as I grew up and like saw, you know, my school was predominantly black and McCormick was almost all black and like understanding the structures that created that, right? The intentional segregation and practices of our city government and the private market. Uh, you're right. But yeah, I'm so grateful for these other experiences that have really enriched me because um, it makes you more thoughtful. It makes you more key. You like you are always, and I think this is also as a black woman, you're always looking out for who is not at the table. I, are being silenced, you know? That is the first thing that I do every space that I walk into mm -hmm. now in the Zoom. Mm -hmm. in any Zoom that I walk into or any room that I walk into, I always look to see who's not there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I recognize the privilege that I have to be in those spaces, but I always call it out Yeah. in terms of who's not here yeah. and why. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your campaign. I want you to know, let's talk about it, girl. Let's <laughs> You I was like starting off on the campaign and then he's like, no, they want to know who you are. And so I'm like, yeah, oh, no, because I want to bring people on a journey. Right. I yeah, think in order yeah. for people to really understand, you know, your life, they, yeah. they, have, they need to know who you are and what shapes all the decisions that you, you made. And I know you, you said you went to law school. So what, yeah. um, talk a little bit about how that experience and you also work for Elizabeth Warren. So come on, bring it, bring it, bring it. Tell yeah, them yeah. About it. So, yeah, so I went to Columbia and then I came back here and I, which was great. I went to Harvard Law School and Harvey Kennedy School. Um, and one of the best things about going to um, Harvard was my mom was working at Cambridge Hospital around the corner. So she like always brought me food twice a week. So like I used to, I was like, I used to be a cooker when I lived in New York. And then when I came back and I was in law school, I didn't cook at all because my mom was always bringing me food because she was like five minutes away. Um, what was really great about um, going, being, going to Harvard is I was back home. So Mayor Menino appointed me while I was there to be a student. Uh, I was the only student on a committee that was thinking about how we redesign our student assignment process. And that was my first foray into city bureaucracy. Um, and as a young voice, knowing uh, the importance of having young voices at the table, which is why I advocate for two, um, two students on school committee and giving them full voting power. Because there were times when even as a student, like that experience was disempowering because I didn't feel like I could speak up and I didn't know who my allies were. Um, so I really think we need to do everything we can to empower our young people as part of our, as part of our political process. I also um, uh, was an attorney representing families facing eviction and foreclosure in Boston Housing Court. That work brought me all across the city. So I was like, on Saturdays, I would spend my Saturdays knocking on doors on families living in, uh, in foreclosed properties, telling them of their legal rights. So I was in East Boston, Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester, High Park, because the, with the foreclosure crisis that hit all of our neighborhoods, our Black and Latinx families the most. And so I would be using my English, my my Creole, uh, my French when necessary, my, my I call my my struggling Spanish sometimes, well, to make sure that we were communicating to people what their legal rights are um, and that there was legal help for them so that they could stay in their homes, right? So when we're talking about displacement, those are issues that I've been working on when it was when I stand in court to represent families and make sure that they can stay in their homes. Um, and, you know, there's a shortage of lawyers representing families in Boston Housing Court. So every Friday I ran an eviction clinic where folks would come and I would help them with their uh, legal, with their um, the, their their documents that they would present to the judge that would help them preserve some of their legal rights. Um, and sometimes there would there were folks who couldn't make it to our clinic, and so they would call us like, "Can you come to my house?" And I'd be like, "Okay." And so that's very much how I think about this run and how you have to show up for people. What does it mean to meet people where they are? It like actually physically means getting out of your place of comfort and meeting someone who have for whatever barrier. It's a, maybe it's a barrier rooted and steeped in racism or ableism or whatever. They can't make it to you. You make it to them um, because there's obviously uh, an asymmetry in resources. Like they don't have the resources. City Hall, so you the budget, you know, multi-billion uh, budget. Um, how are we meeting people where they are? And so that's what I did during law school. After that, I worked for a federal judge. Um, and then I worked uh, on voting rights and redistricting cases. Um, and I worked for a client that was working on national criminal justice reform, helping to elect progressive-minded prosecutors like our prosecutor here, Rachel Rollins. Um, uh, I didn't work on her election, but my sister did. Um, and she is now an ADA for Rachel Rollins. 
And then from there, I worked for Senator Warren um, as her top attorney on her presidential and Senate campaigns. And for me, I um, you know, I don't just work for any candidate. Like I have to make sure that I'm inspired by their message that they're that they're leading on progressive values. And for me, the senator really exemplifies what it means to really center the issues most important to Black and Latinx communities, most important to working class communities, right? It's not something that I, I need to be saying more, that we need to be saying more to make sure that we are doing this coalition building is that it is not a zero sum game. When we solve the issues of equity that are facing, um, of inequity that are facing our communities, uh, again, rooted in, um, in, in racism, sexism, ableism, whatever they may be, it's it lifts everybody up. It's not a zero sum game. We are focusing, when you talk about equity, it's about corrective action uh, to correct the historical practices that have essentially stymied the wealth building of certain groups, whether it be uh, based on race or gender um, ability whatsoever, and whatever our intentional pro practice to get us out there. And so um, working for Senator Warren was the experience of a lifetime. From there, I started working, I started my own law firm. Um, where I was doing a number of uh, work, uh, a number of different things, uh, doing some advising, uh, doing some consulting, representing, um, you know, helping. Uh, uh, I volunteer and am a member of the Massachusetts Affordable Housing Alliance, which is laser focused on increasing home ownership in our city and in our Commonwealth to help tackle the racial home, uh, the racial wealth gap that is rooted in home ownership. Right. I'm not going to repeat those embarrassing statistics of what the median average black family has compared to the white fam to a white family or Latinx family, which is even worse to a white family. But we have work to do, right? Yes, and that work is imperative, right? And those numbers are embarrassing. There's like full stop, period. Embarrassing. And we need to use the anger and embarrassment that exists in those numbers rooted in legacies of racism and banks denying us loans and block busting and redlining to, to do everything we can to close that gap. And so I'm running because I recognize that there's an urgency in this moment on the issues that we're facing. This city is unaffordable. People can't buy homes here. People can't rent here. And these are the essential workers who really help to build this city. Mm -hmm. and to make sure that it operates as it does. Um, when we're talking about issues of equity and education, I took y'all a little bit on my education journey. Um, and I, you know, had the good fortune at the end of the day of my BPS education opened the doors for me, right? Period. How do we make sure that it opens the door for every single kid, whether you are a black girl from Mattapan or a white kid from a working class family in Southie or in Charlestown, right? When, you know, I know that BLS, Boston Land School, is a center of the equity debate, but the BLS that I know and that I went to is a school for scrappy kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, who have, well, you know, a lot of potential and who want to be challenged. How do we make sure that every one of our schools is that? And yeah. so um, I'm running on those issues, affordability, housing, addressing the issue of the climate crisis, making sure that we are building cities where we are centering the needs of our working class families, whether they can read or not, whether they have a job or not, whether they own their home or not. How are we making sure that they're at the table? Yeah, so I, I really do appreciate the, 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 the messaging around the inclusivity piece. I'm curious about how, how that has landed in communities that have um, been hardest hit, right? Like I'm talking about black and brown people in particular, right? Yeah. Um, because we know that there is a disconnect, right? We know that while I do appreciate the whole idea of like everybody, all boats need to be lifted, but the reality is, is that when we look at segregation here in the city of Boston, and when we look at all of these policies that have been um, put in place is that there is a segment of the population that has been hardest hit. Yeah, always. I am, I am, I am that, right? Like. Right. I am that, um, and and so there is a tension here in the, in Boston, and and you know how do you how how are you how are you reconciling with that? Like how how are you dealing with that tension? The tension meaning like how we've historically disregarded and not invited to the table and intentionally excluded Black and Latinx communities from participating in the prosperity of the city is. That's what I'm, when I'm talking about, we need to be as intentional about our policies that bring folks to the table. That means like, I'm not someone who likes to pay lip service to an issue if I'm not gonna work on it. So if we are really serious about this question about improving our schools, let's let's do everything we can, throw everything we can. There's a Student Opportunity Act, there's, a, uh, there's money coming from the federal government to fix our schools so that a family living in Mattapan has just as good a chance as getting their kid into a top tier 
one school as a as a family living downtown, right? Mm -hmm. When I was I'm talking to folks today who are like, oh, you you survived the Taylor and the McCormick. Why? And like I hate that framing. Like I will never. I do not talk about surviving schools, right? I believe when we're talking about our schools, we talk about them from there. Were, I told you the story about my middle school teacher, but there were great things about the McCormick. It was a place that allowed me to experience art and that allowed me to experience- My, niece, my niece graduated from the McCormick and what I talk about is what BPS has is a marketing problem and the yeah. way we talk about schools. The mm -hmm. school, the students are not failing. The system has failed the students, right? Right. right. Um, and, and so that is what we need to tackle. Um, right. And yeah, I, I, I'm with you 100%. But tell our audience if they, um, cause y'all gonna get on this train right here, okay? So um, tell us how, where, where your social media, oh shoot, I have a 30. Hurry up, tell us. Shoot, oh sorry, I didn't know about, rootsyforboston.com. I feel like we just talked, but it's rootsyforboston.com is my website. I'm on social media. Rootsy for Boston on Instagram. The gram is where I am. Um, also Twitter, Rootsy for Boston. Facebook, Rootsy for Boston. There's been incredible energy and incredible support. Um, I, I, I'm excited to work alongside Julia on Boston City Council to bring fresh energy, to bring everyone to the table, to uplift my Haitian community, to make sure we are sending, centering the issues and needs that um, of our young people, but we're also not forgetting our old people who are suffering from food insecurity um, around our city. So really um, appreciate this conversation. I feel like we, we did everything and went everywhere. Uh, hopefully um, folks who don't know me um, feel like they got to know me better. Uh, I'm Ruti Louisiane, running to be one of your four at-large city councilors. You have four votes. Um, I hope that you can give me one of them um, and, and help to make sure that we are pushing for a Boston where um, the prosperity of the city is really felt by our working class families, by our Black and Latinx families that have too often been intentionally left off of the table, right? So how do we bring people together? And I will use my experience uh, really bringing people together, really be, I'm open, I'm accessible, I'm curious, but I'm also, and I smile, but I can also come with teeth to make sure that our communities are getting what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you so very much for being with us in community tonight. I'm super excited about you running. I cannot wait to work in partnership with you. You know, I, everybody brings unique um, skills and perspectives. And I think that you would be such a great asset to the team. I'm looking forward to seeing you more on the campaign trail and more importantly, working alongside me um, to change the way we do business. So thank you so very much. I have, I'm late for my 8.30. Love you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.